Stay together, and so thank y'all for coming uh, these last couple of days. Um, so the first day, what we talked about is this question of why should we even care about the world? Right? Why does it matter? Why should it matter to us? And what was our answer? Because God cares about it. Because God cares about it. God loves it, right? And then yesterday we asked this question, thinking about um, if we. Yeah, this idea that we really want to change the world. Like our goal is to change the world. But one of the problems, right, is what? What's the big problem? That the world is actually changing us, right? And so we need to think about our hearts, our desires, our loves, right? And our affections, the things that we lay our hearts upon. Right? And today what I want us to think about is not necessarily the way of change, but maybe a way, a possible way of living a life that might be a life of change, all right? Does that make sense? So uh, I want to begin uh, by reading this quote from some stuff I was reading this summer. All right. So you should have the quote on your sheet. Uh, there is a typo. It's not string. It's striving. So when we get to that, you'll see it. But do not ask your children to strive for extraordinary lives. Such striving may seem admirable, but it is a way of foolishness. Help them instead to find the wonder and the marvel of an ordinary life. Show them the joy of tasting tomatoes, apples, and pears. Show them how to cry when pets and people die. Show them the infinite pleasure in the touch of a hand and make the ordinary come alive for them. The extraordinary will take care of itself. All right, what do you think about this quote? What are some of your thoughts about it? It's a different view. Like, I don't think most people think about it that way. Like finding the wonder in eating tomatoes. But, um, yeah, I, I just thought it was interesting because it's not something that you hear very often. Yeah. Isn't it amazing to think about? I don't really love tomatoes, but I mean, it is amazing that that some people like them. That's fine. But I don't hate you if you like them. Like uh, you know, but I think it's really interesting to think that God made like food that actually has a taste to it, right? He made like apples have a taste, bananas have a taste, right? Uh, you know, uh, tomatoes have this taste. And he didn't have to do that. I mean, he could have made like a powder that you just sort of throw in your mouth and wash it down with some water. And everything would have been just sort of bland, but you'd be nourished. Right? But God didn't make... I mean, he made food that nourishes our body, but it not only nourishes our body, it like gives joy. I mean, it's like every different every food tastes is a different way. Everything doesn't taste like chicken, fortunately, right? Uh, a lot tastes like chicken when it's fried, right? Uh, but everything tastes different, and like you get to enjoy that. That's an amazing thing, right? And if you miss that enjoyment, right, you miss this great gift from God, right? What else do you think about the quote? It's kind of concentrating on the ordinary stuff, like some people try and work so hard to do all this extra stuff when if you just sit down and like listen to the rain and like look at a flower and you realize how beautiful it is and how great it is and that becomes the extra one. Yeah. I mean, isn't there something about like the ordinary becoming extraordinary? I mean, like, you know, when you that that think about in spring when you first feel the warmth of the sun again. Like that's pretty amazing. That's an amazing day, right? When you when you feel like if you're walking along the beach and you begin to feel the wind on the uh, go through the hair on your arms, like that's pretty cool, right? I mean, like I mean those things are the ordinary coming alive, right? And that's actually life. I mean that's where life is is like enjoyed. That's where pleasure is felt in normal things coming alive, right? And how do you you know? And we need to cultivate a sense of that. Cultivate the enjoyment of it. Uh, what else do you think about the quote? I think we're pursuing an epic life. Like, I have four kids, so it's like, hey, I'm trying to have an epic day, kind of contemplative, awesome, theological. And they just want to like talk to me and show me what they grew. 
<laughs> so I just shuffle that off. I've missed that. I think that God's prepared for me. Yeah. And my parents kind of did that to me. They wanted to have epic memories. We never had memories because we were always trying to prepare for these big epic ones. So yeah. there's a whole part of life we'll miss that God's handing to us. Yeah. It's the small things that matter most. Yeah. Oftentimes. And the small things can turn into big things. Like she was saying, like Emily was saying, if you look at a flower or look at the intricacy of on a leaf or in the sky, looking at the stars in the sky, anything, there's just so much to it that you start to see the beauty that God's created in the smaller things rather than trying to look at everything that's huge. Yeah, I mean, great painters and their paintings of flowers are mimicking the beauty of the flower itself, right? It's an it's an epic painting, like the water lilies. Like it's an it's huge, it's amazing. Whatever his name is, he painted it. Like it's like a big deal, right? Uh, I know, I know. The, sorry, Monette. Yeah, she was a wonderful painter, and um, she's one of my favorite all-time painters. I love the way Monette did that. And uh, but as you you know, as you see these water lilies, I mean, what she's doing is lovely and epic and amazing, and she's having to take time to see, right, the world that is around her. Wow. Yeah. So. <laughs> Boom. <laughs> All right. So, what else? Uh, what else? What is, else do you notice? That's just sadness is part of the richness. Um, yeah. Yeah, the sadness, right? Like, if you don't know how to cry, what does that do for life? You have no deep feelings. No cry. All your emotions stay in. Yeah. I mean, you're disconnected, right? There's no, right? I mean, if you didn't weep when Bing Bong dies, or whatever his name is, you know, and uh, you have no soul. Uh, it's, he's a character in a movie that came out this summer, uh, Inside Out. Oh, yeah. Right? Spoilers. Yeah, spoiler alert. Oh, Bing Bong lives. Um, yeah. <laughs> Hagrid is a woman. What? That's not true. Oh, he has an umbrella. Of course. Um, but anyway, uh, you know, one of the things that, th- that this does, I think, is it, it invites us to see that the little things actually matter and little things actually change the way you engage the world that's around you. Anybody know who Dimitri Martin is? No. Okay, Dimitri Martin, he's a comedian, and he like kind of expresses this well when he says, what's the difference between peeing in the pool and peeing into the pool? Right? <laughs> what's the difference? What's really the difference? I mean, it's a bit more obvious. Right. It's a little more discreet. Yeah. <laughs> but you see, I mean, basically, there's still urine in the pool, right? <laughs> and it came from you, right? But it's different when you are doing, peeing into it, right? And the only thing that's different is the into, right? And uh, those little things that you see, right, actually shift the big things in the way that you understand the world around you. And so what I want us to do uh, today is I want to think a little bit about uh, what God through Paul might be inviting our life to look like. All right, And, uh, and hopefully that might reshape your understanding of yourself and the world uh, as we do this. So let's look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 1 through 12. Finally then, brothers, we ask and urge you in the Lord Jesus that as you received from us how you ought to walk and to please God just as you are doing, that you do so more and more. For you know what instructions we gave you through the Lord Jesus. For this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you abstain from sexual immorality, that each one of you know how to control his own body in holiness and honor, not in the passion of lust like the Gentiles who do not know God, that no one transgress and wrong his brother in this matter. Because the Lord is an avenger in all these things. As we told you beforehand and solemnly warned you, for God has not called us for impurity but in holiness. Therefore, whoever disregards this disregards not man but God who gives his Holy Spirit to you. 
Now concerning brotherly love, you have no need for anyone to write to you, for you yourselves have been taught by God to love one another. For that indeed is what you were doing to all the brothers throughout Macedonia. But we urge you, brothers, to do this more and more, and to aspire to live quietly, and to mind your own affairs, and to work with your hands as we instructed you, so that you may walk properly before outsiders and be dependent on no one. All right, as you heard this text, or as you look at it, what are some things that you find sort of interesting or challenging? In verse 11, it talked about working with your hands, and that reminded me of the song that we listened to the other day. Oh, yeah, with my own two hands. Yeah. Didn't put those things together. That's a, anyway. That's a good connection. So it reminds you of that. And what does it make you think? It it just like uh, whatever I thought of the song and what we talked about on the first day. It just like made it more concrete because this is from a different, a totally different source, and it's saying the same thing. Yeah. Good. Okay. What else? Verse twelve is a little bit perplexing. Um, it says, so that you may walk properly before outsiders and be dependent on no one. Does dependent on no one include God in that context? No. I didn't think so. Yeah. But um, I guess I guess that pretty much pretty much says that deal. I, I I knew the answer to that question, but all the same. Yeah. 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 Well it's talking about how living well with other men glorifies God, you know? Yeah. It's talking of course, about you know sexual morality, you know that creates a lot of conflict. Yeah. And it's talking about you know not being indebted to anyone and that causing even more conflict. And then it's uh yeah. And then in eight, it basically kind of sums it all up. It's kind of out of order, but it still makes sense, you know. Right. If ever just disregard this, disregards God. Kind of a big thing, mm-hmm. right? From a Christian perspective, that would be a big deal, right? Um, what else do you notice? It strikes me as very normal. Like, lean into life. Yeah, lean into life. Yeah. Phil says to mind your own affairs, and I thought that was interesting. And it seems kind of like, you kind of want to, you just kind of like live alone with him. And what it also said, Brothers, that multiple, so I'm what saying. Yeah. So minding your own affairs is doing the work that God has given you and to do your work in the sphere that He's placed you. And you have other people who are doing their job and you let them do their job. You don't have to do their job. You don't have to do everyone else's job. Like we live together. Right, And in a community, uh, everybody has their gifts that they use for the good of the whole community. Use your gifts. Let other people use their gifts. And we'll flourish together. Right? Does that make sense? And then I think you also say, and as you do these things, you walk properly before outsiders. Right? There's a sense in which uh, we do these things. We live a normal life before the world that others see. Right? Uh, and and are, are blessed by. What else do you notice? Well, I like what brother said. He called it living well. And most people wouldn't associate Christianity with being concerned about living well. They would hear of doing good, being good, but living well like a flourishing life. They don't associate that with Christianity. Yeah. Because Christianity is normally associated with what? Your soul. Maybe your soul, maybe suffering. Or heaven. Or heaven. Kind of distance from the place in the world, right? Um, What else? And you don't even normally think of work in Christianity, you know, maybe you think about sex in Christianity, maybe you think about relationships, but work, sometimes we feel that this is distant. Any other things that you're noticing? I thought uh, verse 9 was interesting because it said, like, it's about how we've already been, it says you don't need anyone to pretty much explain to you how to love others. But that's not what was interesting because I sort of feel like Yeah. 
Yeah, that's a great point. And let, so let, we, I think we can look, think about that in one of two ways. And one way we can think about it is like you know that you you know that it's difficult to love somebody. Therefore, you know what it ought to look like to love somebody, and it's just hard to do it. Right? Does that make sense? So there's that component in which there's a it's a part of you that it's hard to do. The other part that he's saying is that uh, I know it's hard. And what has happened is that God has shown you. And how has He shown you? How has God shown us what loving others might look like? Well, by, by Him loving us. And how has He loved us? Right? Through the sending of His Son. Right? The entering in. And I think one of the difficult parts about loving people is that we're afraid. Like, I'm really afraid to love you because if I love you, then I become vulnerable. Because... You might not receive it. Right? You might make fun of me. Like I might hurt your feelings. We might disagree. And if that happens, right, like then I'm afraid that I might die. Right? Which is exactly what happened with Jesus. He came in love and we killed him. Right? Does that make sense? So there is a risk with loving people. There always is a risk with loving people. So you can either enter in in love. Or you can remain isolated and alone. Right? Does that make sense? So there's always that risk, and yet he's shown us what it looks like to risk and to come in the person and work of Jesus. Any other thoughts? I like the beginning of verse 11. It says, inspired by the... That was really encapsulated to me. But I like the idea of being like, quietly looking at anchor of life. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, and especially when we're sort of told to live a loud life. You know, uh, to make to make yourself known, to be loud in this world, right? Well, and even kind of the public sort of version of Christianity that we see is a very loud, yeah, kind of version as well. So you could, like, it seems like Paul is saying, like, our life is a life of sort of subversiveness, just you know, quietly giving along and loving people well and loving each other well, and everybody seeing that in us. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Any other thoughts? What, I mean, one of the main things I want you to see here is that God's will for your life. How many of you have always wonder? I wonder what God's will for my life is. Right? Yeah, right? We, I mean, we all sort of have that. Here's what it is. That you would be sanctified. I mean, that's, that you would become more and more like Christ. That's God's will for you. And all these other things, whether your vocation, whether you get married, whether you don't get married, all those things fall under this greater umbrella that God's desire for you, His will for you, is that you become more like Him. And I find interesting in this text, there's three main categories that this gets worked out in. What are the three main categories that He's saying um, our lives ought to conform to? What are the three areas? Sex, friendships, and work. Yeah. Okay, yes, yeah, sex, right? You see that? A faithfulness with our bodies, a faithfulness in community, and a faithfulness in our work. It's, that's pretty normal, right? I mean, it's sort of like this normal, it doesn't seem all that extraordinary. And yet, when you put a faithful sexual life, when you put a faithful community, when you put faithful working into the context of our culture, it is countercultural. It is a big deal. It is difficult, right? I mean, all of us want to do big things. Maybe we want to do big things because they're easier than these little things. Right? Does, does that make sense? Like, I find it more difficult to go home from work and, like, wash the dishes, right? And, uh, and clean up after my kids than to walk around the University of Virginia where it's beautiful, where people know me, where people want to hang out with me. And when I come home, right, I've got work to do. Right? I've been on many mission trips. I think they're wonderful and you should go on mission trips. But I have found it easier to go build a house in Haiti for two weeks than to go home and love my brother and sister. Right? Which is harder. Does that make sense? And, uh, and so these little things... They're little, but maybe they're actually really big. All right. So let's. I want to look at each of these. I think God is calling us to live a faithful, communal, normal life. First, uh, this is expressed sexually. 
Um, I want to say that I think maybe one of the most radical things that you could do is live a chaste life. Right? I mean, one of the most radical things you could do is be faithful sexually with your body. We live in a, I would, I would say, you might be agree, we live in a pretty sexualized culture, fairly promiscuous. Uh, and it seems pretty normal, right? To like touch each other in private places, right? Dating kind of means what? That you get to make out with each other and not be a hoe, right? Not be a player, right? You can just sort of, that's what dating means. We get to do these things. We get to touch each other, right? And, uh, and I think there's this question that we're constantly asking each other, like if you're a Christian, like how far is too far, right? That's a question you want to know because really what you want to do is you want to have your sexual experiences and stuff like that, right? And uh, what I would say is any far is too far. Uh, any far is too far outside of uh, marriage, right? Outside of the context of what God has given your sexuality to be, where it's supposed to be expressed. Um, and I think this is important because the statistics kind of show that there is no difference between Christians and non-Christians with respect to our participation in se- sexual activity. It's the same. And we would like say, oh, that shouldn't be the case. And like, it shouldn't be the case. And yet it is the case, right? And I think what we're seeing is that the, the culture, the world is beginning to teach, is teaching us like how we relate to our bodies and how we relate to other people's bodies, right? And I think what has happened for us as Christians is that what we've done is we've gone along with the culture and we've divorced sex from marriage and procreation. And by divorcing our bodies from marriage and procreation, what we have done is we have actually changed the world. We have opened up right, a reformation, not a reformation, but like a reformation of sexuality, right? a reformation of what it means to be a family, a reformation of our identities, a reformation of intimacy. Right? What does intimacy mean? If you were intimate with somebody, what does that mean? You're deeply connected to them. Well, usually in common parlance, being intimate with somebody means that you like had sex. Right? But being intimate with somebody really means you have this connection. Right? You have this, you share your life with each other. If you go to the mall to buy intimates, what are you buying? Lingerie. <laughs> right? I mean, right? It's so intimate. Uh, right? And basically what we've done is we've taken this beautiful thing about connection and about love and about sharing life and we've completely sexualized it. Right? right? To, 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 to love one another, to connect with one another uh, is ultimately manifested through our sexuality. Right? And... Uh, what, what else is, I mean, what is, what is culture telling you about sex? What is the world telling us? How do we understand it? Have safe sex. Uh, have safe sex, right? So, uh, like, unsafe sex. So, uh, so now we're defining that there is a set, a sex, having sex, that is safe, right? That is outside of, of marriage, right? And outside of commitment, Right? Outside of love, outside of promise, right? But it's safe because what? You won't start a family and you might not get a disease. Right? What's that? I said it's not hundred percent safe. They can bust. Right, they can that's a true statement, right? I was saying that the culture is telling us yeah, yeah, yeah. that we can have safe sex without being married, which is totally wrong. Right, and so basically that we we would also not so we talk about safe sex, but not with respect to our emotions. Right? It's purely physical. Right? The safeness is physical. Well if one of the things that you're protecting yourself from is procreation, then you're, you're like you said, you're separating, you know, the creation of life from sex as an act. Right. It just becomes a um, a pursuit of pleasure thing. Yeah, so, so sex has really become like going to the movies, except, right, it's just an activity that you can do, uh, and uh, I guess movies you pay for, right, I guess you could pay for sex too, but either way, right, it's just sort of like this activity that you can go uh, and enjoy and just have a good time, 
you know, and you enjoy it at the moment, and then the movie's over, right? What else? Is the culture, world, how else are, how else are you being taught about sex? Do whatever you want, but don't criticize what other people are doing. Yeah, purely individualistic, right? My, my, uh, my appetites, uh, my desires, they're mine. You can have yours, right? So individually, we create our own plausibility for what is right and wrong and how we engage the world. What else? It's almost cartoonish. Like, if you go to the boardwalk and have someone do your caricature, like, your head's big and your yeah, yeah. arms are really small. So everything, like, Victoria's Secret or whatever, juicy on the butt, you know, or whatever, it's like, certain parts are just, like, blown up, and then, like, your personality lost. It's just really a cartoonish yeah. version of self. Yeah, yeah. That's right. Yeah, there's a lot of... There's a lot of... Uh, butt graffiti is what I yeah, call it. Graffiti. Yeah. <laughs> There's a lot of discourse in the public circle about seculariz- or not secularization, sexualization of, of people and of concepts. And um, it's just kind of like, you know, there are certain ideas that have been associated with sex now, and there's no way to disconnect them. Yeah. Um, like hamburgers. I mean, <laughs> Hardy's commercial. That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hot tub. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you know these these staples of you know for a lot of people a great time, or or something that's really attractive to them. Right. Um, and you know maybe that's maybe that's beautiful to them, but you know the association is the association is hard to shake. Yeah. Well, and it's kind of permeated everything. I was having a conversation a while ago with my sister and some other people about female music artists, how hard it is, especially for really popular music artists, to not be female artists, to not be promiscuous. You know, it's kind of like that expectation of, you know, there's a few exceptions to every rule, but at the same time, it seems like there's almost, there's two camps there. You're either wildly popular and clothes are optional, or you're Bjork. Yeah, or and work. success is contingent <laughs> on your your ability to be promiscuous. Mm-hmm. I mean, York is promiscuous in a completely different way, but um, that, that doesn't really matter. It's like one of those one of those symbols of success is, and one of those symbols of loudness is promiscuity. Yeah, and I th- I think one of the things I mean. Partially because sex is so powerful, it's permeating everything, right? But I think one of the things that's really hard for us is this over-sexualization of human beings such that like, it's our primary identity. Like the ultimate aspect of your identity is your sexuality. And, and even, like, if you think about movies and the way we are kind of telling the stories of love... Right. The only way you really come to grip to grips and understand, oh, they like love each other, is like when they go to bed together. Right. You, th- we're not even able to be creative anymore about what love might look like or how it might express itself. Right. I mean, we love the pride. If you love Jane Austen and Pride and Prejudice, I mean, she's able to create a beautiful story about love and the complexities of it. Right. Without like the sleeping. But in our movies now, we can't do that anymore. We, we've lost creativity because love is only sex, right? Its highest expression is sex. And what does that then tell us about the way we're able to have relationships with people? Because we love people, and you love someone other than your spouse. And if the only way to express love to another human being is by having sex with them, Right, then that is a it's a it's a uh, malformation of what it means to love. Right? Does that make does that make sense? It devalues everything else. Yeah, and so like like I I mean this is just kind of a moment of confession. Like I have a lot of male friends who I deeply deeply thanks for serving lunch for us today. Uh, I have a lot of male friends who I'm deeply uh, for, in love with. They're my, like, they're my best friends. I want to talk to them all the time. I want to hang out with them all the time. And even, uh, even I have this thing of like, well, if I really love them, is there this sexual component that is supposed to be that way? If I have these deep emotions for someone, do they have to be manifested sexually? Right? Does that make sense? And that, and that goes out into all of our relationships. I mean, I was, 
out at a restaurant last night and there were people, there were women dancing together, like slapping each other on the butts, right? It was just interesting. Their like time together got sexualized. Does that make sense? Yeah, it's like intimacy has been so truncated to that one thing. And then I think that we all long to have intimate relationships. But the way but the way sort of the over sexualized culture is speaking to us and saying the only way to do that is through you know physical experience with one another like that. And so we miss what intimacy is. Right. Um, and we're basically telling you guys that you can't have intimate relationships yeah, until true. you do that. Um, and so, like, I'm, I'm owning that as someone who's in a generation a little bit older than you. We've passed that down to you, and that's really crappy that we've that we've done that. Yeah, and could I not embrace my? I mean, like, one of like my male friends that I embrace. It doesn't have to be sexualized, though it is physical. Like, physical doesn't have to... Y'all are physical right now. You, you're communicating that you love each other right now. Right? It's not sexual in nature. Right? So physical doesn't have to equal sexual either. Um, intimacy doesn't have to equal that. Does, that. does this make sense? And basically what we've done is we've cut sex off from the story of Jesus is what has happened. Right? So what is sex intended... To be communicating. What is how, does that make sense? What is sex intended for? Why did God give it? What did He make it? Show a binding between two people. Show a binding between two people, and I think it goes beyond that as well. What else? Is, that's true. What else? It's actually sacrificial. Nobody thinks about that in a movie scene. But life's a long marriage is devotion and learning and service. It's not just the buzz and the high. It's a long obedience together. Yeah. And it's the act of creating another person. Okay, there's a dynamic approach. Yeah. Yeah, and so sex is created. It's an it's an illustrate. It's like an embodied illustration of God's great love for His people. Is what it is, right? Like God. Why was marriage? Why is sex intended? Right. I mean, we're all broken in this, right? The is and the ought are different. All of us are at different places with our sexuality. But the intended purpose of sexuality, right, was to communicate something of faithfulness and of commitment, of love, of union. Right? When we talk about Christianity and God's love for our, his people, one of the main metaphors that is used in the Bible is union with Christ. Being united to him, being one with Christ, right? God has committed himself to the people that he loves. He's united himself to them. He has entered into them by the Holy Spirit to dwell with them and be one with them. Communicating, and by doing so, he communicates unending compassion and love and presence with his people. Right? And that's what sex is supposed to be for. It is CPR for, rel- for marriage. It is communicating commitment and love. It is procreating and giving life, both metaphorical life to a relationship as well as physical life into the world. And then it's like this joy. It's this recreation of joy that is rooted in the love and commitment that the two have for one another. Right? And so we do the... So anyway, makes sense? So when we cut it off from this grander story, we are telling a different story. We're not telling a story of faithfulness. Like, right? Does that make sense? If we only tell a story of recreation, divorcing it from the communication, do we? Tr- we've cut it off from its intention. Right. Right. So, what I would want to like say here is that maybe one of the things that you can do in this world that would bring about great change is live a faithful life. This is going to be hard for... It's hard for me. It's hard for you. Because everyone is telling you that to do this vision is foolish and a waste of time. It is, it is, uh, it is unhealthy for you. Right? Does that make sense? That's what, that's what we're being... You aren't going to have any intimacy if you don't do this. You aren't going to be able to love... Right? You will never have the affection and touch of another. Right? 
if you do this. And that's not true. You're touching, you're physical, you're communicating intimacy. We love. Does that make sense? And um, anyway, so then uh, the, the second part would be um, he moves us into the relationship of the church. Verse 9. Now concerning brotherly love, you have no need for anyone to write to you, for you yourselves have been taught by God to love one another. All right, so here he's talking about our relationship with the body of Christ. Right? To love the brothers, to love the sisters, to love the family of God that God is making through his union with his people. And so Paul is telling us, like, if you want to live in this world in a new way, you need to enter into the story that God is doing in the world. Right? Why is it so you know this like Christian thing here? You're gonna hear, we're gonna talk about the church. Like, why is the church important? Why do Christians believe that the church matters? It's a community of believers. So it's a community of believers? Why else? It's the body of Christ. It's the body of Christ? What else? At the end of the day, the new heavens and the new earth, it's Jesus and his church. Yeah. Jesus and his people, right? What else? <clears throat> it's, a, it's a community where you can talk to others and become intimate with them without having to worry about other things. Yeah. Yeah, what should be. Right. Should be. Yeah. What else? It's the new Israel. It's God's chosen people. Yeah, it's who he loves, right? In the same way that we love the world because God loves the world he made, like we love the church because actually God loves it. We participate in those things that he loves and we don't always love it, but we cu- we want to cultivate a heart towards that which he loves, right? What else? It's more than a club. It's people that would never have chosen each other. God has picked and messed us up in a beautiful way. Yeah. Like, which goes to what we talked about a little bit earlier. All of our different gifts. I have my gifts that are beneficial to you. You have gifts that are beneficial to me, right? To, for my own flourishing and thriving. Um, anything else about why the church might be important or significant? Because from a cultural standpoint, it unites a group of people across boundaries of, you know, Language, race, age, you know, all those really important things that normally divide us. Yeah, when we only gather with those that are like us, we tell the world, well, we're, we're doing everything you're doing, just hanging out with people who are like us. But when we come from all these different uh, backgrounds and experiences and races and language and tongues and tribes and nations, right, we say something to the world, we're, show, we're, we're embodying, we are the expression, we are the image, the illustration of God's story in the world, right? And so in many ways, the church is actually um, the storyteller, right? It's not only, it, it's the story and the storyteller of what God is doing in this world, right? Listen to this quote from Leslie Newbegin. He says, it's a, or, or read it, uh, it's a well-established fact that the great majority of those who come to faith in Christ come through the witness of a local congregation. Here in the midst of a world of illusions is the place where truth is spoken and celebrated, where God is praised and thanked, and where God's grace is given and received to be poured out in care for the neighborhood. Here is where we learn to live in the story that the Bible tells, to affirm it as our own story, and to see our contemporary world in light of the true story. Here is where we can learn to question the assumptions that are taken for granted in the world outside, where we can develop a certain godly skepticism regarding the things that are praised and celebrated in our societies. The local congregation is the only effective hermeneutic of the gospel. Right, what is this long quote? What's he saying? What is hermeneutic? Hermeneutic mm-hmm. is the interpretation. It's the only effective interpretation of the gospel. What's he saying is significant about the church? It's what brings many people to Christ, or the only way that brings people to It's through the church that people come to know God and His work in the world, right? What else? It teaches existing Christians, I think that's what we're 
how to live the story that the Bible tells. Right. It's a place where what God is doing in the world is embodied. Like the church isn't just a sermon. It's not just a story. I mean, it's not just sort of like words that you hear or liturgies that you do. It is actually the embodiment of God's story in the world. Oh, I was going to say what grace is given and receive grace. Yeah, it's a place where you give and receive grace, right? From God and from others. Our world is so full of illusions and everything that the body of Christ, the church, is a place where that is all set aside and you learn the truth. And you can all fellowship with each other knowing the truth without the illusions. Yeah, it's the place where, it's not only that, it's not a way of escape. Like One of the things is not it's escaping the illusions. What it is is a place where we gather and we are reoriented to what is true so that we can see through the illusions. You spend most of your week walking through the fog, right? And the church is a place where we gather to be reoriented, right? So that we might see through, see rightly once again. Right, so let me draw an illustration. Let me try to draw this out. This is the way I think about it. Usually when we think about Christianity... We think about it on this mm-hmm. axis of believing the right things, right? And doing the right things. Does this make sense? So Christianity is if you believe the right stuff or you do the right stuff. Is it, right? Isn't that Christianity essentially? Um, and so this is this is where in our culture when we think or in the in the world in the university we have this th- tendency to think about Christianity as a philosophy or an ethic. Right? And so usually conservative churches are very heavy on believing all the right stuff. And uh, progressive liberal churches are really usually great at doing all the right stuff. Right? Fair? Um, so anyway, what I want to say is we usually think on the sexes. What's, what's missing if this is how we understand Christianity. Maybe unity. Maybe unity. One should be feeding into the other. They ought to serve one another, but what would help them serve one another? Jesus. Right. <laughs> Sunday school. Uh, the story. <laughs> the story of God. Right? And out of the story of God, we believe Right, the story of God sets our beliefs, and then the story of God uh, sets our doing. Does this make sense? Now, uh, what I want to think about here yeah, for a second is uh, stories. Like, you know when you, uh, you, some of you might be at this place even now, you know how like you get a really big book, like you get Les Mis, and you want to read it, it's like one million pages. And you're like, where are the pictures? Right? And you know, where are the pictures? There's no pictures in this book. Uh, throw it away. It's not worth it. I'll see the movie. <laughs> um, you know, but like uh, every, whether the book has illustrations in it or not, every great story has an image that holds the story. For instance, if I say Elder Wand, what do you think? Harry, Harry Potter. Potter, right? If I say lightsaber, Star I think Star Wars, Wars right? And so basically, the story of God also has images, it has illustrations, right? It has symbols, right? So what is the first illustration or the first image, the first uh, symbol in the Bible of God's story in this world? A cross. Okay, well, that would come in the New Testament, yeah. so even creation. before that. What's that? Creation. Uh, so within creation, not creation itself. Adam? Adam, right? How was is, how is humanity made? In the, image. in the image of God. Humanity existed, right, as the great storyteller of God's work in the world. What's wrong with humanity as the storyteller? It's called a false story. But Adam began to tell a false story that God was not trustworthy. He was not worthy of obedience. And we've continued that, right? And so what is Jesus doing? He's actually bending us back to the true story through repentance. 
Okay. Now, what do you see? See, this is like a Christian uh, diagram because we have a cross now. <laughs> see that? Uh, and so, uh, basically, the church is the image of God in the world. The church is the storyteller right, in this world as we're bent back to that true story through the fog, right, through the illusions or, and all those sorts of things. All right. And does that? I mean, and that sh- that reshapes your understanding of church. Church isn't just like this boring thing. It might be boring. I mean, it might be, and that's okay. But it's the place where we, as God's people, gather to tell and to be retold the great story of God in this world. All right, so we're running late. I'm sorry. Um, the last thing is just thinking about our work. Verse 12, 11 and twelve. Aspire to live quietly, to mind your own affairs, and to work with your hands. What do you think about that? It shows that God values work. God values your work. Your work is not in vain. Right? Your work matters to God. And not only does it matter to God, it matters to other people. Because your work benefits others. Whether it's economically, or whether it's with the products that you produce. What else? Yeah, you work at the thing God has given you to do. Right? And you do that in faithfulness and love for Him and your neighbor. Right? And what I hope that you get out of this is like, these are little things. Like, we would say these are the ordinary mundane things, but they're the things that make the world work. They're the things that make the world lovely and beautiful and exciting. Right? Um, All right, somebody pray to close us.